Hi, I'm Tracy Iraka, Executive Director of the MDS Foundation, and uh, we're here today at the first workshop for myelodysplastic syndromes in Miami, Florida, and I wanted to bring some of the conversations that were happening today to our patients and their families at home just to understand why we're doing what we're doing, how these conversations are going to translate into patient care. So I'm joined by three lovely panelists that are going to each introduce themselves, and then we'll just have a couple of, of quick questions that will uh, I think be really important to our patient and family audience. Uh, hi, I'm Rena Buckstein from the OJAC Cancer Center in Toronto, Canada. I'm Rafael Behar from University of California, San Diego. Hi, I'm Valeria Santini, University of Florence and MDS uh, group in Italy, all Italy then. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, and thank you for taking the time out of this busy day to chat with me. Uh, I think we can start by talking about some of the things that we um, we mentioned during the sessions this morning, and um, primarily about clinical trials, about why those trials are so important to our patients, the importance of considering a clinical trial, and also why um, there was so much talk about improvements that need to be made in the clinical trial process. Rena, do you want to start? Sure. So um, first of all, clinical trials are the only way that we make progress in this disease. Um, it's only with, with, with you know, initial phase one, two studies to establish safety and efficacy of a drug, and then finally phase three studies that establish that one treatment is better than the other, um, that we move the field forward and hopefully impact um, important endpoints and the endpoints that we discussed today at great length are what are the most important endpoints but I think the consensus was um, quality of life for our patients which is negatively impacted by the disease as well as overall survival and uh, especially in our higher risk patients so um, a lot of what was discussed today in the clinical trials was what are the most important endpoints we should consider and are the existing clinical trial endpoints that are being considered for licensing the appropriate ones, yes or no? Um, and also, how do we better optimize our trials to quickly answer these questions? Thank you. Is there anything else to add? I know there was a bit of conversation about making sure we include the right patient, really patients that are more indicative of the disease, into these trials for obvious reasons. Uh, does anyone want to elaborate a little on that? about why maybe that's not happening right now or why that's so important to, um, as we're looking forward, to include the right patients. Yeah, I can jump in, jump in. Generally speaking, our clinical trials are designed to test the efficacy or safety of a drug, and we're looking for patients that don't necessarily have a lot of other things that might confound that answer. So we tend to include patients in our clinical study that are probably a little bit healthier, maybe perhaps a little bit younger than the patient population that actually has the disease. And it's important that we keep in mind that when a drug is approved, it's going to be used in the broader population. So we want to make sure that we're looking at patients in our clinical studies that look like the patients who come to our clinic outside of that clinical study. And we want to make sure that the endpoints that we're looking at are reflective of that broader population, that we're not just looking for the most fit or the healthiest or the youngest patients in our clinical trials. Thank you. Dr. Santini, do you have anything to add? No, I absolutely agree. And I would add to these that sometimes we tend to uh, treat the patients with MDS irrespective of their molecular or their genetic uh, um, differences and alterations. And this would be very important, on the other hand, to, to consider. So if we um, not only consider the entire population, but also the characteristics of the individual patients, maybe we can offer them the, the best therapy. And again, it would be very important to include patients in clinical trial offering these new agents that sometimes are really specific for uh, genetic alterations. So this means a two levels of characterization of the patients. That is very important. And one general thing I always stress with my patients is that if you are included in a clinical trial, the attention and the care you receive is much higher just because we control and we check that nothing is happening to the patients because of the evaluation of the safety of the drug, but also because we want to record any possible uh, change in their values and their counts in, uh, in, a, in a way that they will feel, I think, very much more followed than uh, usual. 
I, I would also like to add that um, you have access on a clinical trial to perhaps the most important cutting edge drug that's going to change the natural history of the disease, sometimes two, three, four years before it's widely available uh, in the general public. So it's another way of accessing you know, exciting new targeted agents. And as Valeria said, um, our ultimate goal is to personalize our therapies, mm -hmm. right? Is to look at an individual patient and say, this is the right treatment for you. And with the best possible chances of response and maybe the lowest toxicity, for example. Wonderful, thank you. So a good segue actually into the next topic. And Dr. Behar, you talked a little about the new um, IPSSM, so the prognostic scoring system that now includes mutation information. So I wanted to ask, um, first, maybe just a little explanation about why that scoring system is so important. Also, the importance of testing um, for MDS patients. Should all MDS patients consider it? Does it uh, is it different from lower risk to higher risk patients? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the premise, which is that when a patient's diagnosed with MDS, we have to try to understand what their risk of their disease is. Is their disease a disease that's likely to progress rapidly, or is it likely not to change for a long period of time? And that will influence how we treat patients. So our therapies for MDS are what we call highly risk stratified. So we need to have some tools by which we can assess or best predict the risk of a particular patient. Do they have high risk disease? Is it intermediate risk? Is it low risk? And the tool that we've been using for the last decade is called the International Prognostic Scoring System Revised, because it was a revision of a prior system. What we've done now with a publication just in this last month is include a very important piece of additional information, which has to do with the types of mutations that patients have in their disease. These are typically mutations that the patient was not born with, but mutations that have arisen in just their blood cells that are actually responsible for the disease itself. And they can tell us a lot about it. They can tell us how the disease is likely to progress in the future. It may tell us what drugs are best to give particular patients. So I do think it's really important that we sequence really everybody who has a new diagnosis of MDS, in part because it can help us apply this prognostic tool, the IPSS-M, now molecular, referring to those genes, but also because it can help us understand what this patient might be best likely to respond to. In certain cases, they may even have a particular gene mutation that tells us that this particular drug is the best drug for them. So it is something that I think is becoming more and more the standard of care, and uh, it's something that we do routinely at all of our centers. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so our last topic today, but, um, but certainly not least, I was impacted by one of the slides earlier that showed really the fact that the standard of care for MDS patients hasn't changed a whole lot in the, the past few years and, um, and, and why that's so important. And what we're talking about here as far as the importance of the research that's happening, um, what we're learning in, um, in what could be some maybe promising new treatments for our patients or even just new thoughts for clinical trials and really where the future of treatment for MDS patients is headed. So maybe we can do this by saying, what's, what do you think each of you is the most promising? And maybe you'll think the same ones, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, but Well, we, he we heard a lot about um, the uh, immune environment, the immune microenvironment that um, helps uh, it may contribute to the development of the myelodysplastic syndrome or the ongoing develop, uh, progression of the disease to higher risk disease. Um, so targeting the immune system um, is kind of the uh, holy grail um, and using the, uh, the immune system to number one attack the cancer cells but also maybe dampen down an immune system to prevent it from actually uh, making the disease progress. Um, is, is an area of a lot of active research. So I'm very excited about that. And in particular, um, this whole concept of inflammation, um, making patients who have um, lower risk myelodysplastic syndrome um, progress to higher risk disease or leukemia um, is sometimes driven by this inflammation that can be targeted. And there's a lot of exciting new drugs um, um, in the pipeline for targeting this aberrant inflammation that um, may halt earlier forms of this disease and, and, and even you know maybe cure it, for example, if, if it actually does what um, some of the agents we um, are being tested, we hope they do. So um, I'm very excited about you know those areas of research. Thank you. 
Dr. Behar? I would echo that. I'm really excited by the large number of new things that are being brought to MDS. And I, I put them in two different categories. Some that I think are more near term on the horizon are actually being borrowed from other diseases where they've been either approved or shown efficacy. So acute myeloid leukemia, for example, has had a, a bunch of new drugs that were recently approved in the last few years. And some of them may be very efficacious in, in MDS. And we're starting to see the clinical trials that are helping prove that. So I think in the near term, we'll be adopting some of those therapies that are applicable in AML in MDS patients, and they'll help out. But some of the new modalities that, that Rena was talking about, it, addressing the immunologic landscape of patients, looking at to totally novel pathways that haven't been tried before, I think this gives us hope that we may find something that's really transformative in MDS, and there will be more and more clinical trials aimed at doing this, and I, I hope that we make quick progress there, too. And being the third one, I absolutely <laughs> agree with my colleagues. But I would also like to say that what we are actually trying to do now is to couple new agents, more than one agent, with the standard of therapy. Meaning that we want to attack the uh, myelodysplastic cells, the cells that maintain the disease, uh, from different points and from different angles so that we can have more specific uh, um, targeting of some alteration as we mentioned and uh, at the same time have an immunological help or a stimulation of the uh, immunity against the dysplasia. So we are changing our approach, cop cop coupling uh, more uh, agents uh, at the same time and taking care that the safety of the therapy is maintained and the patients do not have a risk of uh, excessive toxicity. I think that this is a new approach for MDS. We never did it really. We always had standard of care for high risk plus one new agent with different uh, mechanism of action. And for lower risk, again, we used only single drugs usually. And now we tend to couple more drugs to uh, have a synergistic effect and uh, uh, higher efficacy. So this is something also that is new and uh, promising, I would, I would hope, I would so really hope. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think this meeting has shown that getting everyone together, the uh, researchers, even some regulatory patient advocacy groups and the clinicians can really benefit patients. And uh, again, thanks for your time. I know it's been a busy day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.